Today, we're in the second to last chapter of 1 Samuel. And if you were here last week, just by way of recap, David has been living a lie for the last 16 months of his life. He's been living out of fear, he's been living out of anxiety, and he has been living a deceitful life for the last 16 months. He's been hanging out in this town called Ziklag, and that is in the land of the Philistines. And and he's been living there, and he's been raiding against the people in the area, but what he's been telling King Achish of Gath, who's the guy in charge of that region, is that he's been raiding against the Israelites. He's been telling them, like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm on your side, right? And I've made myself a stench in the nostrils of my own people. He's given himself the intentional reputation of being a traitor. And if you were here last week, you saw the moment when God got a hold of David once again. And we once again see that David has come through it and he's come to the place where he realizes, I have sinned, I've made a mistake. And he says, I need to strengthen myself in the Lord. And he does it. And I've been so looking forward to this sermon all week because we finally get to see David be David again. Because he's been living a lie for so long, believing lies for so long. He's not been acting like himself. And this week, what we're going to see is what happens when a person turns away from lies that they're believing, stops living into and out of them, starts to live into and out of the spirit of Almighty God. What happens in that person? And it's beautiful because we're going to see David be filled with the Lord's Spirit in so many profound and beautiful ways. And, and, and I want you to keep in mind, church, as we see today's scriptures fulfilled and, and read through, there's so much truth in here for you and I today. There is so much application about what God in his spirit does to, to, to the believer or even the, the non-believer who comes to the place where they say, I've reached the end I've believed lies. I've lived out of lies and I'm done with that now. I'm coming back. Lord, what do you want me to do? That's all of our stories, right? If you're in Christ Jesus, at some point, that was your story. And so this, this Sunday, we get to see that at, in action in David's life where the man who's been living a lie and in deceit for 16 months finally comes back and is once again, and he never wasn't, but he's actively once again the man after God's own heart. He comes back to Ziklag, first thing that happens. He's coming back. He didn't, God actually spared him from having to fight a battle against his own people, from living into the reputation he's been building himself. God provided a way out. He comes home, and what does he see? Ziklag has been burned to the ground. The very symbol of the deceitful life that he has been living, the lie that he has been believing, the lie he's been living out of, it is rubble. It has been destroyed. It is ashes. And the Bible said last week, in, in last week's chapter, that all of the wives and children, all the possessions, they had all been carried away. But it was also very intentional. The scriptures were very intentional in saying nobody was killed. God spared them. God provided protection. God provided, uh, basically, he transported Gabe's people away. I just called him Dave. I'm going to start doing that now. (laughs) But anyway, God takes David's people and he takes them out of Ziklag. Then they burn Ziklag to the ground. The very symbol of his lies has been destroyed. And so make no mistake, church, they came home, their wives were missing, their children were missing, their possessions were missing, but there's nothing left but ash. And sometimes, in order to destroy the lies in our lives, the Lord will burn those lies so that we can come back into the freedom of the truth. He doesn't want us to live in the oppression and in basically the jail cell of the lies that we believe in our lives. He will destroy them if he needs to. And it might be very discomforting at times. And that doesn't mean that he's sitting there saying, I can't wait to cause so much pain. That's not it. No, he's saying, I can't wait to set this person free. And that's what he did with David. He gets home to Ziklag and it's gone. And he realizes, oh man, I've led us to this place. And so he gets on his knees and he says, I need to strengthen myself in the Lord. This week we see David not only be restored, we see David be renewed Look at what he says. We're going to see a couple of things in today's passage. We're going to see David become what he once was. We're going to see David filled in many ways by divine spirit to accomplish the things that God has had for him. The first thing that happens is he acts like a priest again. 
which is great, right? This is how David used to act. And it says, look at what he did. He, he, he looks at Abiathar, and, he, and Abiathar is the priest. He's the son of one of the priests that was killed. Um, and he came to David, and now he's been with David, and he brought the ephod, which is, we'll talk about that in a minute. So he's been acting as David's priest with these 600 guys. And he, he, David says this in the scriptures. He says, bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And so David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him. God answered David. He says, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Okay, before we talk about that, there's something to note, okay? Because this is profound and it's beautiful. But the ephod, okay? If you're not familiar, we've talked about it before in this church, but just by way of review, the ephod is a, 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 uh, it's a piece of, it's an article of clothing. It's sacred. It was, it was, it was created during the, the uh, law of Moses. It's, it's very specific to the priesthood. They would wear this when they're consulting the Lord. It has different kind of relics and things that are on it from decorations to specific types of articles and uh, those kinds of things. But the point is, what it represents is the very presence of God. And when a priest would wear it, they would wear that to speak to God. And essentially what David is saying when he says, bring the ephod here to me, what he's really saying is, bring me the presence of the Lord. And it's been a while since he's done this. But again, if we look at the law of Moses... He's not supposed to be wearing this thing. Priests, by the law of Moses, are from the tribe of Levites. They're from the tribes of Levi, rather. And, and David hasn't been trained as a priest. He's not from the tribe of Levite, uh, Le the Levites. But he has worn this before. He has consulted with God before. He has acted as a priest before. And he has not been condemned for it. And here he is once again saying, give me, give me the ephod. It's time. I need the presence of God. So what is the reasoning? Why can David wear the ephod and not get in trouble for this? Why is it that he is seemingly able to break the law of the Lord and Moses and say, hey, this is something that's not for me. This is for the priest, but I'm going to use it. I'm going to consult with God. I'm going to talk to him myself. Well, one, he wants to know whatever comes next, he's hearing it straight from the Lord. He is seeking the Lord with all that he has again. He hasn't been doing that for the last 16 months. But there's also a reason why God allows this. And it's because God is not just looking for David to be a ruler of men. That is not a king after his own heart. He's looking for David to be more than just a ruler. He's actually looking for David to represent and point to Jesus Christ, the ultimate king of king and lord of lords. And what is Jesus? He's not just the king of kings and lord of lords. The Bible also calls him in Hebrews the high priest. You see, when David was called by God to be the man, the king after God's own heart, God is looking at David saying, you're not just going to rule people. You're not just going to lead armies. You're going to do what a priest does. And what is the definition of a priest? It is simply a man who connects other people with God Almighty. And he's looking at David and saying, that's who you're supposed to be. And you can't be a good leader unless you start there. So David wears the ephod. He inquires of the Lord. And what does he do? He asks what many of us would ask in a crisis situation. God, what do you want me to do? Right? Like, I don't know what to do here. Everything's on fire. What am I supposed to do? And so God tells him something. He says this. He, he makes a promise. And this is really important, church, because we can miss this. He says, pursue them. Go after that enemy. And I will see that you will get back everything without fail, you will recover all. And this is a beautiful promise that the Lord makes David, which we're going to see fulfilled later in the passage. But he makes David this pro promise that, hey, you've been lied to and you've been believing lies and you've been lying yourself and living out of those lies for 16 months, but you've turned now. You're listening to me again and I promise you, you're going to recover everything. You're going to get it all back if you'll pursue the enemy. Go after him. Don't let him get away. And it's a spiritual promise to David under the old covenant that he will regain his material wealth. And we actually do have a very similar promise under the new covenant, but it's actually a lot better than that. Think of this for a moment. The promise for David is you've lost your stuff and I will make sure you get your stuff back. 
and I will make sure that my glory is revealed to the world. But to promise to you and I is deeper, it is better. See, he's restoring David in this moment. But his promise to you and I is that we're not just restored, we're renewed. And that's deeper than material wealth. See, for David, he's going to get back his stuff. And, and, and the reality is that sometimes when Christ sees a sinner turn from their sins and come to Christ, or when Christ sees somebody who's been struggling with their belief and has been stuck and trapped in lies for months, it's very possible they may repent and not get their stuff back because the stuff is actually what caused the problem, right? A lot of the times. It's possible. We might not get the material stuff back. However, under the new promise of Jesus Christ, the Bible says this, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's 1 Corinthians 5, 17. And the Bible also says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made, past tense, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, church, and raised us together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's Ephesians 2, 5 through 6. Also, past tense, and he says also, we are, are children of God, present tense, and if children, then heirs, heirs with God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. That's Romans 8, 16 through 17. You know the beauty of all of those verses, church? They're all either past tense or present tense. And sometimes we as Christians, oh boy, we, we can sometimes look at these verses and say, someday, Someday I'll die and then I'll be a co-heir with Christ in heaven. Someday I will be considered uh, with, alongside him. Someday, once my fleshly body has passed away and I, I ascend into heaven like Christ has promised, then on that day I'll be made new. All things will be gone. New things will have come. Someday that will happen. Someday I will be like the children of God. And that is not what scripture says. Scripture says you are right now, today, a new creation. Not going to become a new creation. You are a new creation. It says he made you alive. You're alive in him right now. You are raised. You are raised, past tense, up together. You were made to sit together in the heavenly places of Jesus Christ. And you are, right now, children of God, co-heirs with God joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You see what's happening? When God makes this promise to David and says, hey, you will recover everything without fail. He's using David as a means to point us to Jesus Christ, to the greater promise that we have through the new covenant. You don't only regain things. You don't only get restored in Jesus. You are renewed in Jesus. It's not, it's not just back to the life you had. It is better, richer, fuller, deeper, more profound life than you've ever experienced. And we can live into that right now, today. You don't have to wait till heaven. So what happens, right? God is giving us a taste of this future promise through David. And yet David, now we see what happens because now he has to walk out in obedience. God has given him a mandate, said, hey, pursue them. Pursue the enemy. And if you do this, you're going to get all the stuff back. And so David goes to his men and he listens. He takes off his ephod. He has, he has sought the presence of God. He has sought the word of the Lord. He has heard it. And he goes to his people and he says, God says, if we pursue, we're going to recover. And so he rallies his 600 men and off they go. They follow the trails. It doesn't really give you the details, but they figure out, okay, there's the trails. We're going that way. And we head off. And this is beautiful, church. He heads to the brook of Basor. And the first thing we see that David gets filled with once he repents of the lies he's been living out of, gives himself back over to the Lord, seeks the Lord's will, and then obediently follows after God's will is he is filled with many godly attributes that he has been lacking for a long time. The first one, he's filled with godly compassion. They get to the brook of Bezor and there's 200 guys who are just exhausted, like physically exhausted. They can't take another step. I'm going to do a little fun fact here. If you were here last week, maybe you remember, um, we talked about when David first came to the Philistines and he was running scared for his life to, to King Agish of Gath, he pretended to be insane, right? He was all alone. He pretended to be insane. They figured out who he was and they said, get this guy out of here. What do we need an insane person for? And he runs. He goes back to home. 
He gets his 400 refugees and then all of them leave and they go to a place in the Moabite region and it's considered, it's a fortress. They're very safe. They're behind big walls. And then the prophet Gad came to David and said, here's the word of the Lord. Don't stay in the fortress. This is not where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be the king of Judah. Go back to Judah. Leave the safety of the fortress and go home. I called you to be the king over there. Go there. And David went. And things went well for him for a while until he got afraid again. Then he left. And now he's back in the land of the Philistines. And if you remember last week, what we saw is that he's been living in Ziklag under a lie for 16 months. And he is not in Judah. Guess where the brook of Bezor is, church? It's in Judah, right? God has actually, once David has repented from his lies and moved back towards following after God, the Lord himself has moved David and his entire troop out of the land of the Philistines and back to where God said you're supposed to be. And they get to Basor and there's 200 guys who are just too tired to go on. These people have lost their families. They've lost their wives, their children, I mean, that enough is enough to like get you super passionate about pursuing the enemy, right? But these guys literally couldn't take another step. And you would think maybe, you know, an army that's all ready to go and all, all amped up for the fight, they'd be mad at the people who aren't pulling their weight. But David, in an act of genuine godly compassion, says, you guys wait here. We're going to drop our supplies. We're going to leave them with you. This is actually going to help my 400 others pursue them quicker. We're going to get to the enemy faster if you guys do this job. So you stay put, stay by the brook, rest. Find rest here. We're going to move on and we're going to keep going. And so they do. Make no mistake, church, this isn't just a strategy. This is an act of godly inspired, spirit-filled compassion in David. Let's keep going. Verse 11, and we're going to see even more godly compassion. Verse 11, then they found an Egyptian in the field and they brought him to David and they gave him bread and he ate and they let him drink water. And then they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water for three days and three nights. And then David said to him, to whom do you belong? And where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man from Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite. My master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. Verse 14, notice the we here. We made an invasion of the southern area of the Chethrites in the territory which belongs to Judah and the southern area of Caleb. And we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, can you take me down to this troop? And so he said, swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master and I will take you down to this troop. Who? This guy's the enemy. This is the very person that they're pursuing. Like this is one of the people that they are pursuing that caused the harm that has all their family kidnapped, all their possessions are missing. This guy said, we burned Ziklag. The the insinuation here is that he was part of the raid. He was burning down their stuff. He was destroying their stuff. He was there when they kidnapped the wives and the, the children and took away all their things. But notice what David did before he even asked, who are you? He nursed this guy who's at death's door back to health. I'm reminded of a story that Jesus taught. And he taught it for the very purpose of teaching religious people what it actually means to love like God loves. And and I'm sure you've heard it. It's called the story of the Good Samaritan. And the idea of it is that this guy is on a road and and he gets just attacked by brigands and robbed and left for dead. And he's sitting there by the side of the road. He's he's near death's door, just like this Egyptian guy. And a priest walks by and he sees him. He's like, ugh, I can't go near that. And he walks around him and he goes away. And then a a Levite comes by and he's like, ah, I don't want to go anywhere near that. It'd make me unclean. I don't want to help this guy. And he walks around and he pursues and he moves on. And then the Samaritan shows up, a Samaritan who is generally hated by the audience that Jesus was giving this story to. So this was a, like a decrepit and, and vile person that, they, that he's giving this attribute to. And the Samaritan walks by and he sees the guy. And then he makes a personal investment in the person who is at death's door. He gets him to an inn. He gets him food. He gets him water. He nurses him back to health. And then he says, I'm going to give some money to the innkeeper to make sure that the innkeeper keeps this going, that treats this guy that needs triage and has been through trauma and hardship. We're going to make sure that this guy is made well again. 
Jesus teaches that parable as a means to teach a group of religious people who have gotten so caught up in the law of the word of God that they've forgotten what the love of God is about. And he uses it there, but it is happening in real time right now in the passage we're reading today in 1 Samuel. David literally sees a man by the path who is at death's door and he nurses him back to health. He gives him food, he gives him bread, he gives him water, he gives him raisin cakes, I guess just to see the guy smile, you know? Give him something that's more than just bread. And then it's after they nurse him back to health, after they, they, like after they do the good work, then they ask, by the way, who are you? And they hear, oh, I'm your enemy. And how does David respond? Let's make a deal. Will you tell me where your troop is? And the guy says, hey, I'll do it, but you better swear to your Lord that you will leave me alone. And David's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Now, the Bible doesn't say much about this Egyptian, right? This is pretty much it. We don't know what happens to him after this, but I guarantee you, this guy walked away free, and for the rest of his life, he remembered the compassion of David. And most likely, just from the culture of the day, he probably asked himself the question, what God does David serve that he would be compassionate on me, one of the people who burned his very village and stole his family? I bet he asked that. This is godly, Holy Spirit-inspired, spirit-filled compassion that David is now just receiving, that he's walking once again in obedience with the Lord. But he's not only filled with, <coughs> excuse me, with divine compassion, he's also filled with divine strength. Let's keep reading. Verse 16. When he had brought him down, there they were. This is the Amalekites. They're spread over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And then David attacked them from twilight until evening of the next day. That's like a 24-hour period there, church. Maybe more. He fights them for, for a full day. And not a man of them escaped except for 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. David didn't have any camels, so he couldn't catch them. So there you go. Verse 18. Watch this. So David recovered all. God made good on his promise. It's exactly what God promised to David. It says, so David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away and David rescued his two wives and nothing, nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. Church, the promises of God are dependable. If he says he's going to do something, he is going to do it. We can trust in them. And we will use all kinds of human wisdom and understanding and logic and knowledge and, and sort of things to sort of weave our ways in and around how, wait, no, that's not what that promise means. But if God promised something, you can take it to the bank. He means what he says. He does what he says. He makes good on every promise. And then it says in verse 20, then David took all the flocks and the herds that they had driven before those other livestock. So this is additional stuff, not the stuff that they took from them. It's the other places they've raided. And he says, this is David's spoil. We'll come back to that in a minute, but David actually makes it out even better than just getting his stuff back. He actually gets more stuff. And we'll talk about what he does with it in just a minute because that's also an act of divine empowerment. But isn't this great? Like again, David, up until last week, he's been living a lie for 16 months. This guy's not been acting like the man after God's own heart. He's been acting out of lies. He's been believing lies. He's been living out lies. He's been acting as a man of deceit. But when God brings that to his, uh, his knowledge, he turns, he repents, he strengthens himself in the Lord. He reaches for the ephod and says, I need the presence of God. God, what should I do? And then he's obedient to what God calls him to do. He gets right back on track. And after 16 months of living a lie, it looks like he hasn't skipped a beat. Church, God is not up in heaven looking at the believer who is struggling and saying, well, I guess I can't use them anymore. And he's not looking at the sinner who has yet to repent saying, I'm never going to get a hold of that person, so I'm just moving on. No, if anything, he's up there saying, man, I want to break them out of that prison. I want to get them home to the truth. I want to bring them back to the place of joy. This is what's happened to David. He's been living the wrong identity for a year and a half almost. 
But now today he is once again the king after God's own heart. David is, a, is the epitome of Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Paul tells us there that we are supposed to have this kind of mindset. That we are supposed to forget what is behind, straining towards what is ahead. We press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's what David's doing. It's been 16 months of lies, but you know what? That's over now. That's done. The Lord has gotten a hold of me. I am focused on the pursuit. That's what David is doing. That's what we are called to do. Forget what is behind. Strive towards what is ahead. Strive for what God has called you heavenward in Christ Jesus. Don't be distracted by especially the lies of the enemy who would get you to remember over and over the things that he caught you in in the past. Move forward. Amen. Move forward. When you follow after a God who can fix every problem and whose mercy is new every single morning, uh, whose steadfast love knows no end, some people, in fact, this comes up in the New Testament, some people might actually say, why wouldn't you just go on and give a lifestyle of sin? Why not? In fact, in Romans, they say, hey, well, if grace abounds, then should we sin all the more so that grace would abound? And Paul's response is, by no means. What are you talking about? I would argue then, for those people who say, if grace is that strong, then man, it doesn't matter. Just live life however you want, right? I would argue Ephesians 3, 18 and 19, which says when we really grasp what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, when we know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, then we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Church, when we understand this, we understand how much he loves, how deep is his mercy, how powerful is his, his sacrifice that bought us at such a high price. When we realize the kind of God he is, that he is a savior God who loves us desperately and deeply, then the very taste of sin starts to become sour in our mouth in comparison to the presence of a holy God who desires to live within us, beside us, before us, and behind us. We lose our taste for it when we really grasp the goodness of God. Why would we sin so that grace by about? Are you kidding? We've died to sin. How can we become slaves to it again? That's how Paul would put it. That's how David would put it. He's forgetting what's behind, striving towards what's ahead. He is once again the king after God's own heart. He never actually stopped being that. He just needed a nudge. He just needed a reminder and a repentant heart. But he doesn't only receive compassion. He doesn't only receive divine strength to fight the battles that God has called him to. He also receives divine wisdom, which is thro shown through his leadership and his generosity. Let's finish out the passage, and then we're just going to talk about this. This is wild. So verse 21, now David came after the fight. He comes back to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David, whom they had made stay at the brook Basor. So they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. Verse 22. Really important here, church. We're going to take this one slow. This is really informative us, on us today. This is a hard one. Then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered and said, well, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may leave and lead them away and depart. But David said, my brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us. Who's preserved us and delivered us into our hands the troop that came against us? For who's going to heed you in this matter? Nobody's going to go along with this, he's saying. But as his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. And so it was from that day forth that he made it a statute and an ordinance for the Israel to this day. Now when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoils to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, here's a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. To those who were in Bethel, to those who were in Ramah, to the south, those who were in Jatir, those who were in Aurora, those who were in uh, Eshtemoa, those who were in Reshel, those who were in the cities of oh, Jeremelites, uh, those who were in the cities of the Canaanites, those who were in Korishan, those who were in Atach, those who were in Hebron. Aren't you glad I didn't make you read that one, Anora? Like, yeah. <laughs> those were in Hebron, right? And those were all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed to roving. Church has a lot 
in this final passage. There's a lot here. There is so much here. Okay, let's take this. First of all, again, look at the compassionate wisdom of David. Look at the spirit-filled leadership and discernment that he shows in this moment. They left 200 men at the brook of Besor, men who were so weary that they could not follow. They couldn't follow. They were so tired. They were not in the fight. They did not risk their lives. And they were behind, and they stayed put. And those who went ahead, who were in the fight, who did risk their lives, who fought the victory, won the victory, they come back and they say, well, this isn't fair. These guys shouldn't get what we won, right? We gained wealth over here that we do not want to share. In fact, we so don't want to share it. We're just going to give them their family, and they're going to tell them, go. You're not really part of us. You 200 who stayed, you're not part of the real army of David. You're just, you're just lazy, they didn't want to share in the spoils of the victory that God himself provided to them. And the Bible calls those people wicked and worthless men. Let that sink in for a moment. Because I could see us, I could even see myself actually thinking, that makes sense, right? They didn't fight. They didn't risk their lives. If I was a fighter, I'd be like, I risked my life. I, 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 I deserve this stuff. I mean, why would they get paid the same? They didn't risk their lives. They did risk their lives. They deserve more pay. They shouldn't get the same thing. Like, that makes sense, right? Especially to an American mind. It's like, that's more risk. That's a harder job. They just got to hang out by a brook, drink water, and sit by the supplies for a couple of days. They, they shouldn't get the same amount of pay. Wicked and worthless, church. That's what it says. This is important, church. This is warning for you and I. Do you realize that we can be following after God we can even be gaining the victories that he has empowered us to gain, fighting the battles that he is putting his spirit in us to fight. And yet, when we receive the victory of those battles, not be willing to part with whatever the prize is that the Lord has provided. And we make that our idol. Our wealth and our possessions are so hard to remove as being the first thing in our lives. It's so hard. The hardest idol for most of humanity to recognize and put down is our stuff, our perceived wealth. We look for it to be our security, to be the thing that brings us joy, to be the thing that, that brings us greater relationships with others. You know, I have a boat, so I don't have a boat, but I'm saying like, I have a boat, so we can take people skiing and that makes people our friends. And you know, like we do that. But if you're not careful, it becomes a trap. And the very thing that the Lord gave you to help increase his kingdom becomes the thing that you cannot let go of because it's become an idol in your life. You can't take any of it with you, church. That's what the trap of it is. And this is probably the hardest lesson that Jesus had to teach, too, because he taught it all the time. He had to teach it over and over and over again. He's regularly teaching about, hey, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or wear. Hey, if you're going to give, give cheerfully. Hey, look at that woman in the, in the temple when that one guy throws in all these giant coins and she comes in and gives half a penny. She gave more than him because it was in her heart to give and it was sacrificial in giving. My goodness, that woman gets the kingdom of heaven. Jesus preaches on giving and wealth and possessions all the time. He does it regularly because this is so, so hard for us as humans to grasp that our stuff, boy, it's just not as important as we think it is. And it is actually given to us as a means and a purpose in God to help steward the creation that he entrusted to Adam. That's our job now. He gives us things that the kingdom would benefit. He gives us things that the world would benefit. This is his MO. This is why God loves a cheerful giver, right? The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Anyone who gives should not give uh, under compulsion, but should give what they believe in their heart to give because God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver realizes that if God clo clothes the lilies of the valley and feeds the birds of the field, man, and if he cares so much more about you than he does about them, then what do we have to worry about? If they don't worry about their clothing, if they don't worry about where they're gonna get their food, why are we worried? We are more valuable to God than many sparrows is what the Bible says. Right, so a cheerful giver says, man, this has no power over me and that person has a deep need, so here it goes. Use this in the name of Jesus. Use it so that you may benefit through the kingdom and the blessing of God. This is God's MO. He's always done it this way. He will bless the individual to bless the world. It's what he did with Abraham. 
He started with Abraham and he says, I will make you a blessing. Abraham, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing to bless the whole world. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's Jesus. And then David does something incredible, right? These wicked, evil men who are following after David are basically saying, we don't want to share the stuff. We want to keep the stuff. We fought the battle. God wanted us to fight. We won the victory. God wanted us to win. But when the stuff got our way, we did not want to part with it. Wicked, evil men. And then David says something out of this divine empowerment of leadership. He's like, come on, guys. As it is his who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies. And he basically tells him, nobody, nobody in this troop is going to go along with what you're saying. Nobody's going to go along with that. This is the most ridiculous idea you could possibly have. Seems reasonable, right, to us today. But back then, he's like, who in the world would back you up on that? No, these people were watching the supplies. Somebody could have attacked the supplies. These people made it available to us to go faster because we didn't have to take the supplies. We caught up quicker, right? They watched the supplies. We fought the battle. Everybody's working for the kingdom of God. Everybody receives the benefit. Basically, the lesson that David is trying to teach is that if God gives the victory, then what comes of the victory is meant to benefit all the kingdom of God, not just the individual. If you find freedom in Christ over something that has kept you in slavery, share that with someone else. They're probably caught too, and they need to know how to get that freedom, and they don't know. If, if, if the Lord has blessed you with wealth and you're looking at somebody who has not been blessed as wealth, I'm not talking about like, you know, the, the sharing of all things so that everybody's exactly the same. We're not talking about communism here. We're talking about generosity. We're talking about spiritual generosity. And that's what David ends up with. And here's the beauty. He does what a leader after God's own heart should do and will always do. He lives by example. He doesn't just say these words. He doesn't just say, man, nobody's going to go along with you. This is how it is. Look, God provided a victory. Let's all share. Let's share. No, David leads from the front. He does something that's a great example of leadership. What does he do? Remember back in verse 20. Verse 20 said this. David took all the flocks and the herds of the Amalekites had driven before those other livestock. And he said, this is David's spoil. Right, so David did not only recover what he lost, he actually personally benefited. He gained more. He gained some wealth by doing this battle, by winning this fight. But what does he do with what he's gained? He gives it away. He doesn't keep it. He gives it away. He sends it to the leaders of all the places where they would travel and stay, the people who helped him in the past, the people he watched over in the past. Like Some of these people aren't people that sheltered him. They're people that he kept safe. And he gives them the wealth that he had accrued through the victory that the Lord had given him because he doesn't look at his stuff as belonging to him. He looks at it as belonging to God. And if it belongs to God, it belongs to God's people. And so he distributes that out to the people that have made an impact in his life and helped them. Now this is a king who is not ruled by an idol, an idol of wealth or, or position or stuff. This is a king after God's own heart. So what we've seen is David return to some of the roles that he has abandoned for the last 16 months. He acted like a priest. But upon turning, God filled him with divine compassion, divine strength, divine wisdom, divine generosity, divine counsel and leadership. So what do we do with all this? How do we conclude this, church? This is a beautiful passage of scripture. This is maybe one of my favorites now after studying it this past week in all of 1 Samuel. I cannot say this enough, church. All of this that happened, all of this filling by God's spirit upon David, the strength, the wisdom, the courage, the, the compassion, the generosity, all of these things, these are divine attributes that God is pouring into David. Every single one of them came after 16 months of believing a lie and living out of a lie. And they came the moment, the moment he strengthened himself in the Lord, turned back and said, I need the presence of God in my life. Tell me what to do, Lord. I will obey. As soon as he did that, this is what the Lord showered upon him. The amount of time and the amount of struggle that we go through while we are running from God, it's nothing in the eyes of a God who is eagerly awaiting to empower you and equip you for everything you need for life and godliness. 
It's nothing to him. He's looking for the obedience and he can empower you, not only restore you, he can renew you. The moment David stopped and realized what he had become, the moment he strengthened himself in the Lord, God himself corrected David's path and restored him and renewed him to even greater paths. God, again, I can't say it enough, church, God is not up in heaven fixating on our faults. He can't because they'd already been purchased at the cross. If he wants to fixate on your faults, he has to look at the cross because they've already been purchased there. He's not up there saying, I can't use that person. I can't use that person. I'll never talk to that person again. No, that is not what he does. God, when he looks at you, if you're far afield and you're saying, I just, I don't know, I'm struggling. I don't know, I'm running away from him. I don't know, I'm believing lies. I'm running away from him. God's just saying, oh man, turn. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Come back to me. Ask for my presence, I will give it to you. Ask for my leading, I will give it to you. Follow me, I will fill you. I'll not only restore you, I will renew you. You will be a new creation. You are already a new creation if you're in Christ Jesus. If anything, he is eagerly calling us back with the truth so that we will stop giving grounds to the lies that we believe. Some of those lies were taught to us by very religious people. And we still need to be set free from them. He is awaiting the moment that we come into full, genuine surrender to him. And in the blink of an eye, God can do for you even more than what he did for David in today's passage. It's what he does. He loves to do it. He takes what is dead and he makes it alive. He takes the heartbroken and he showers his joy upon them. He takes the lost, he makes them found. He takes sinners and he turns them into saints. This is our God. This is what he is. This is what he does. Maybe that's you today. Maybe, maybe somebody's in here and they're just, they're just I almost broke into song there because I realized I was saying the lyrics. I didn't mean to. <laughs> but, but maybe there is somebody here who's believing lies right now. Maybe, maybe you know, you've been taught something that makes it sound like God's up in heaven being like, I can't believe you're still struggling with that sin. He's not. He's saying, get out of the prison. Come back. I'm offering you freedom. I can't wait. Amen. I can't wait. Stop believing the lies, church. Turn now. Come back into life. Come back into his divine presence. This is our God. And oh, what a mighty God we serve. Let's pray, church.